to it with Larry Kudlow, the host, of course, our wildly popular show at 4 p.m. Kudlow, and again, the uh, former economic bigwig in the Trump administration. Larry, good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you, Neil. People still say this ain't the 70s. I always add yet. What do you think? Well, that's a good yet. I mean, everything we've seen is disappointing, including today's CPI report, yeah. where there really was no particular Where the relief. trend has been, the uptick in prices continues. Yeah, you're 5.4% last 12 months. It's not good. Now, the consumer deflator, personal consumer deflator, which is a broader measure, the Fed uses it, it's running a point lower. But still, the trends are not good. And to, I was thinking how to make this as easy as possible to think about it. There's two sides to this. One is what I call pandemic inflation. And those are the supply shortages, essentially supply shortages, people slow to come back to work, those kinds of things. And that's not a policy issue. It's just you, you have a once in a hundred year event and you turn the spigot off and then you turn the spigot back right. on. It's a hard thing to do. A very hard thing to do. And uh, one good thing, I'm not a big fan of Joe Biden, but his conference today with um, FedEx and Walmart and uh, Jimmy Hoffa and the Teamsters is a very good thing because the supply shortages, Neil, the containers backed up in L.A. and um, and Long Beach, that's becoming a national emergency. And I'm glad President Biden is on it. So that's one half of the story, the so-called temporary part. But one reason I'm beginning to turn more negative on the outlook, I'm looking at the monetary part, the Federal Reserve keeps pumping up the nation's money supply. Now, I understood that during the pandemic. Right. We needed plenty of cash. But in the last six months or so, last eight months, uh, bank deposits, uh, M2, the Fed's balance sheet, they're still pumping it in. They're giving us more money than we need. And we've gotten used to it, right? We need, it's almost for, like investors, it's like a fix. Yeah, right? it is a little bit you like worry, a fix. Huh? It's nice to have free money. The stock market loves free money. Yeah. I, I'm getting worried about it, okay? I'm getting very concerned about it. And to a large extent, all the spending and borrowing is being financed by Fed purchases. The Fed has bought 57% of the new bonds issued by the Treasury. That's a bit Latin American style, Neil. We so don't if you have draw that. back from that, rates can only go up, right? Yes. I mean, yes. so we'll see that. Well, Larry, knowing that you were coming here, a lot of our viewers were, were, you know, filing left and right, trying to get emails and videos to you. One we have is from David from Texas. This is David. How can the inflation be tamed if the Fed keeps on pumping money into the economy? He raises a good point. How do you tame inflation when you keep adding money that compounds the problem? Yep. David's a pretty smart guy. That's my monetary inflation side. And that thing's creeping up. I mean, really, that's, we are running so far ahead of normal cash. There's so much money out there. I kind of like this story. The Wall Street traders would tell you the banks and the money funds and insurance companies are literally coming to the New York Fed at night. We have more money than we know what to do with. And so the Fed is doing these, they're called reverse repurchase agreements for five basis points. They'll take the money and they'll give it for five basis points. They'll give them a treasury bill. Uh, it could be an overnight bill or a three-day bill. But that is 1.3 trillion of that going on every day. It's, it's an incredible story. And it's propping this up, right? Well, I'm just saying the, the question Dave from Texas asked is a most important question right now. Because these supply shortages, that'll eventually get worked out. Don't ask me when, but eventually it will. We can open up containers and we can get truck drivers and we're going to have to pay them a good wage. Okay? Not easy, but we can solve that. Right. But the Fed pumping out all this cash constantly, week after week, I mean, uh, M2's now growing at 12 or 13 percent. We're well into this recovery. We don't need that. We don't need to do that. You're referring to a money supply. I heard people follow. It's a good baseline. And that use. will increase inflation. Yeah. If it can, I'm telling you. It already one. is. It already is. Uh, there's another issue, too, that comes up, and that is this supply chain disruption, yes. Larry. And it prompted this question from Kyle in Massachusetts. Take a look. Hey, Neil. Uh, big concern of mine is the microchip shortage. What uh, is causing it? And uh, like at the root, like where did it actually start? And how do we get to the end of it? And when do we get to the end of it? And will those prices just continue to go up over time?
They've been going up, up in the way, right? Yeah, I mean, have, how, what, this is so, an interesting phenomenon. Right. right. It's another good question. Um, to some extent, look, I, I had Wilbur Ross on last night, former Commerce oh, Secretary, sure. just knows everything there is to know about semiconductors and chips, okay? So we walked through this. Taiwan is producing big. Uh, so is South Korea, Sam, uh, Samsung. Um, Taiwan manufacturing. I mean, they're fabulous uh, semiconductors. Problem was, first, a bottleneck in some trading ports, Vietnam being one of them, also China being another. Vietnam may be more important, believe it or not. And second, coming from Asia, the added chips, we only make 12% of the chips that we use, so we're relying on the rest of the wow. world. And yes. a lot of it, Asia, Long a lot Beach. of it, China. Yeah, Long Beach and L.A. And if that friction continues, particularly with China, Larry, that could compound the issue, right? Well, yes. The, the yeah. short answer is yes, and probably the long answer is yes. Our relations with China deteriorate. The Chinese have moved, Neil, to a, away from their market reforms and a very state-run, almost totalitarian political operation, which is crunching down the economy. They're attacking their banks. They're attacking their private sectors. Yeah, good. and they're resorting and, and going back to form on the brute stuff, right, That's and the military right. That's stuff. Right. That's a little scary. They're threatening Taiwan. You know, Taiwan is very important. If you're worried about ships, Taiwan is huge. You're right about that. And so is South Korea. Um, we're bringing them back here, okay? We're using some subsidies. Not my favorite thing, but this is national security. Um, Taiwan semiconductor manufacturing is coming to Arizona, and the government will pony up some additional subsidies. But it's a problem. Automobiles, yeah. I mean, these are not specialized chips, and that's why it, it goes back to Long Beach and L.A. They're in containers, and yeah. you and I should just go out there and unpack the damn container, okay? <laughs> Somebody's yeah. got to do it. I know it's bad when they say they're running out of cargo ships, too, like these stewards that want to get their own cargo ships that, that they can't get the cargo ships. Well, ship. you know what else, too, came out with the Biden meeting today? I mean, the longshoremen, bless their hearts and souls, really should be 24-7. Yeah. This I was surprised they weren't. Pre right. Yeah. I had heard rumors they were closing shop at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. They should be paid for it, Lord knows, lots and lots of overtime. But this is virtually a national yeah, emergency. This is a, yeah, you're quite right about that. Uh, we have this question from Don in Texas, uh, Larry, saying that I've always thought of inflation as the tax the government doesn't collect. Is mm. this a good way to view it? Well, yeah, I mean, inflation is a tax. It takes away the purchasing power or put it, the money you have in your wallet or your pocketbook, literally the cash you have or in your checking account, is diminished. Its value goes yeah. down by the rate of inflation going up. And so it is a tax. And you see it most clearly. I mean, we didn't get any relief today, particularly. Um, energy prices up 1.3 percent. All right. We could talk about that. But uh, food up 5 percent year on year. Food no, is None of that's eight, abated. None of that's abated. It gets worse. Eight and a half percent annualized last three months for food, 21.4 percent for energy. Oh. That's a tax. That's yeah. an inflation tax. And was it John Maynard Keynes? You knew him. I, I didn't quite I didn't know him. Many, many times. You, were, you talked But, you know, usually it cruelest, starts with energy, right, Larry? And you've been, you, on all. your show, you talk about that, where it started in energy. Some, you know, go back to the Biden days when they're stopping the Colonial Pipeline. Yeah. Uh, but bottom line, it started with energy prices. Others have followed suit, and they continue to. Do you see that trend continuing? Unfortunately. Yeah. Unfortunately, I do. I mean, look. We were the world's number one producer at over 13 mar million barrels a day yeah. pre-pandemic. Now we're down to 11 million barrels a day. And we're begging them to make up the difference in the production that we me want. crazy. <laughs> and we're giving Russia, you know, I mean, come on. Yeah. We could have, uh, gasoline's up a buck. I'm not saying it could have totally been avoided, but a lot of it could be avoided. And there was a story, I, I think it was the front page of the journal today, anyway, someplace in the paper. These um, frackers don't, they don't want to make investments because they see these headwinds coming from Washington. Why bother? They don't think you it's money blame. well spent. They, they can't blame uh, Guys, I want to skip to, to Lee from Alabama at a good view on this low rate environment and how long it could last. Take a look. They're in this downturn in interest rate, almost record low interest rate, did the Fed increase the maturity of the bonds on 
that we have outstanding. And the second question is, are we, who's buying the bonds? In other words, change the mix. Yeah, you the hear duration. That a lot. The yeah. duration. Um, the answer is yes, comma, but not enough, period. Now, we had this, I really persuaded Trump we should be selling 50 year bonds or 100 year bonds. Remember when they were kicking that around? Right. So, yeah. uh, What's look, the benefit of that? It would, you're locked into those low rates for a long, long, long time. Exactly. You have, you said, you have a, say you have a 3% 30 year mortgage. Right? I'd like us to do the same thing with the federal government. Right now, the 10 year is what, 160. Uh, lock yeah. it in for 50 years, man. Because they're only going up. You, by the way, do you see gonna rates go going up oh, a lot sure. higher from here? Because the normal yes. Fed funds at this point should be at 3 or 4%, given this environment, right? Well, yes, I think that's right. Um, nominal GDP, money GDP is growing at, I don't know, 10%. You can't have a zero Fed funds rate. You can't have a 160, 10-year bond. Yeah. Uh, so, I, no, I don't like bonds. I think rates are going to go up. Um, we have extended the maturity to a little over five years, all right, in the Treasury financing. Um, Steve Mnuchin, my good friend who was Treasury Secretary, uh, acknowledged 25 and 30 years maturities. We didn't get there. I wanted 50 or 100 years maturities. Trump wanted 100 years. You know, President Trump, former businessman, he knew a lot about debt. He knew a lot about borrowing. Right, right. So he understood this issue. I think, to correct me if I'm wrong, Japan has 50 or 100 year bonds. Britain does. And they've had Mexico zero does. rates for what? Forever. 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 Yeah. Larry, so good to see you, my friend. Uh,